Hello community, so great that you are back. Welcome to part two of reinforcement learning with verifiable rewards. Second print I want to show you, second preprint is of course directly connected. Here we have Carnegie Mellon University, October 9, teaching now our LLM agents to know when they know enough. So we talk about here knowing when to stop as an agent. When should an agent stop and say, hey, listen, I have enough rack data. I don't need more. I have enough information. Stop it. I'm going to show you here a simple example. And here you have, for example, hey, what are the symptoms? Or have you been under stress or whatever? And then the system says, hey, final diagnose, a panic attack. And then here we have the same. And then you go on and you have more questions. And suddenly you have, hey, do you have a history of heart disease in your family? And the answer is, yes, my father died at the age of 50. And so suddenly the final diagnosis by the eye is, oh, it must be a heart attack. When in reality, it was just a panic attack. So you see, it is not that the more information you get is better. It is, there is a right amount of information and all additional information has less value for the decision process of an LLM agent. And there the agents should know when to stop. But how do we code this? Because on the one side of the spectrum, we have an agent that thinks forever, and this agent is useless. And if we have an agent that acts prematurely without having all the data, can be really dangerous. Just look here at the medical example. So this is the agent's halting problem, when to stop. And this is a core challenge unsolved here in meta reasoning for agentic systems and multi-agent systems. Now, the autopsy of this new paper chart, recognize that the standard supervised fine-tuning is terrible for the task. This is not a solution at all. Because you will have a dialogue and the system is thinking here, makes a decision, okay, let's continue the conversation, let's continue. And then at some point in time, your agent must say, terminate. I have all the information that are necessary for this particular task. And now, given a certain, let's say, statistical evidence, I can say I have enough data and I terminate. And then I come to a decision. So the model, the AI should terminate when there is sufficient information. But how do you train this system? Now, the core idea of this model is creating pairs of training examples. So remember the positive and the negative training pairs that we see seen already in, in the BERT models, in the sentence transformers. So we have training examples that are almost identical, but have optimal, opposite optimal outcomes. So we have a positive trajectory and we have a counterfactual trajectory. We notice this is the classical schema, plus and minus. The positive trajectory says, hey, after five steps, I have enough information so I can have now the label terminate this conversation. And the counterfactual trajectories, learning here the negative examples here, says, okay, there was just incorrect information or not relevant information given to me, so I have to continue the conversation to really get to the data that I need for a medical decision. As I showed you, now the task is to train an AI system that says, okay, here I have for a particular analysis of medical condition enough data, and here I just got some, I don't know, not so important data, but then I got a question and then I reference only to the question and I ignore the rest. How can you train an AI to behave this? So what they did is, what they did the experiment is the authors tell us, hey, the learning, to make the learning more robust and generalizable for this AI system, as we experimented, if you just give them the positive and the negative labels to the training data set, it's not enough. So if you just give terminate or concatenate to the, or continue here to the label, this is not enough. But if you give here this, let's say another LLM, and this LLM generates now a short reasoning trace, a short rational explanation, from starting from a chain of thought, and explaining now why the decision is the way it is, then this is helpful. But we have to do this on both sides, on the positive side and the negative side. So for the positive side, this might be an example. Hey, if your family history uh, confirmed, all key indicators for panic attacks are present and the heart attack is less likely, I have sufficient information and the AI is going now to make here the formal answer, create the formal answer. And it's interesting that the author said this verbalized reasoning acts here as an explicit interpretable value function. And if you remember value function reinforcement learning, 
Adaptation, Optimization, Value Function, Q, Q Learning, teaching it a model to articulate its own confidence. So, a reasoning trace is suddenly all that we need. And the author said, by fine-tuning on this contrastive reasoning augmented data set, now the model learns here the marginal value of information. What information is valuable, high value, and what information is absolute marginal? So it doesn't just learn to follow the patterns, it learns to recognize the precise moment when the information it gets is sufficient for the action or not to come to a conclusion. And if you want, this is a direct practical blueprint for building agent that can balance. And again, like in reinforcement learning, I told you it's a different beast. We have here the exploration equilibrium with the exploitation equilibrium. So when to gather more information or when finally to decide, hey, I have enough information, I can act on it. And now CART provides here a method to train the models to hopefully use here the minimum necessary compute. Effective termination policies here for reinforcement learning are best learned not just from an imitation scheme, but from contrastive reasoning with an explicit chain of thought reasoning trace. And now at this moment I thought, but wait a minute, if this is the training data to enable the eye to do this, but do I not have to provide all contrastive reasoning? So let's think about I don't know, fluid dynamics or solid state physics, no? I mean, there are so many other possibilities. Our solution space is huge. How can the system learn if I just give you two, three or ten examples, ten positive examples and ten negative examples? How can it not know that maybe example number 12 is missing? So I should have the problem that I need all contrastive reasoning, no? Now, it turns out that's not the case. So, for an abstract, generalizable principle learned by this CI system, they say, information that causes your dramatic collapse in the uncertainty of my differential diagnosis has an extreme high value. And the AI tells us when I receive such information, I should consist consider terminating now my investigation, because I got some high value information. But you see, this is what I do not understand. I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't know. But I think there are so many factors, so many medical parameters, blood pressure or whatever chemical in your blood or whatever configuration of symptoms you might have. It is, I don't know, a, a good incomplete system. No? How can you say at a certain amount of time as an EI, hey, I have an extreme high value and therefore I can stop my diagnosis? I'm not convinced that this is really the way forward. I see that it increases here the performance of the system. But I think we are missing out on something. Now, the authors argue it is not learning what is important in a vacuum, but they can go here with context relevant, but rather how to evaluate, evaluate here the importance of this new information in the current context. So if you have already asked five medical questions, of course, you are context relevant. And now the sixth question or the sixth answer to the question falls in place. And now all those six together give you either a high confidence vote as an AI system that has learned from historical data, from past data. But can you be sure that now in this new actual case, there's not another new medical condition that was not in the training data of the AI system? So in this particular case, maybe I'm wrong, but I think you should be careful that there's this problem of completeness and incompleteness. If we go now to the original paper, you have it here in a beautiful mathematical way. So give me a problem X, an information-seeking process like a rack system producing here a sequence of observation O for output and an intermediate reasoning token Z and a particular policy, a strategy of your AI, pi theta, that chooses whether to continue or to terminate at each specific step, we define now an objective function of an adaptive termination S, and here you have it. Here you have your terminate function. Now, I would say, let's look at the performance. The problem of deciding when to stop 
gathering information, like in a rack system. When should a rack system stop optimally? It is challenging because it involves maintaining accurate estimations of both the already acquired and also of the still missing information. Given this particular training of a domain-specific AI system, let's say in medicine, and it requires anticipating what information might be available if the model spends more compute or more interaction step or continues to go out and find external rack data. You see, this is an imbalance I do not feel comfortable with this particular matter. Now, the authors tell us we designed it here, a method for teaching LLMs to terminate effectively when the information is enough. And by training on counterfactual examples, and this is perfectly reasonable, this makes sense, LLMs learn to recognize when they have acquired sufficient information to solve the task. So we have a termination explicitly triggered here by our reasoning process, by our complex reasoning traces, and in doing so, improves here the separability of output representation, leading here to a better performance. Now look at this. Those are now the data. And just look here at A, so at the upper half here, where B would be the out of distribution, but let's say in distribution. Eh? And I've given you here, just look here, the blue, uh, the, yeah, the green dot here is this new methodology. And what we have, just a second, what we have here is on the x-axis determination index. This means how many questions were asked before stopping. So how long your agent had to interrogate or had to go to rack system to fetch new information. How many steps were necessary. And you see that with this new card system here, the green dot, here we are. And of course, the more we are to the left, the less energy was used, the less compute time was used. So the more you are to the left, perfect. But we have also the success rate on the y-axis. No? And you see cart here, the green dot is great, but there is an orange dot. This is now cart and reinforcement learning. So we are back to, remember, reinforcement learning is another beast. Here we are again. Now, the authors argue that because this orange dot is more to the right, so we have to have more questions asked, more rag system done, so we use more energy, it takes more time, we spend more money, and the increase, let's say, from, I don't know, 32 to 34, is not in relation to the termination index. So the argumentation is, yes, we are a little bit below the reinforcement learning methodology, so we are here, but we are much more to the left. This means we are much more cost effective. So this is now a specific equilibrium you have to decide if this is important for you in your job, in your company, for your business. I would naturally go for the higher performance. I would orient myself here on the y-axis higher. Because look here, the blue dot here is the QN 2.53B instruct with a reasoning prompt. This system would have the best performance in the success rate, but it would use the most energy. It would ask maybe questions that are not necessary. It would spend here the most time. So a waste of energy, a waste of time, a waste of money, but it would have the best performance. So now you have to decide, do you go for a little bit lower performance, but yeah, acceptable performance and you save a lot of energy and a lot of time or do you go just for the absolute performance this is something you have to decide for yourself anyway take away or just tell us hey improves both the task success rate and determination accuracy and they did it here on two domains the medical diagnostic domain and they tell us here terminates precisely when the diagnostic accuracy saturates outperforming here the basic supervised fine-tuning and, of course, yeah, fixed-length baseline in both in-distribution and out-of-distribution. Plus, they also looked at the mathematical reasoning domain and they said achieves a higher accuracy with fewer reasoning tokens than a typical reasoning showing adaptive and better allocation of test time compute. So whenever you have your priorities for the allocation of test time compute, you decide which methodology to use. I think two beautiful studies, October 8, October 9, here we have Oxford and Buenos Aires, and here we have Carnegie Mellon in the US. Beautiful. Both are talking here about a very similar topic. Both try to find solutions here. So 
individually, these two, these two papers are in itself really brilliant, beautiful ideas. The second paper, maybe with a question mark, but the first paper is just gorgeous. But if you put them together, they are kind of a roadmap, you know? Why? Because the base model, the first paper, provides the architecture. A latent skill library managed here by a cognitive scheduler or a driver for a base model. So we don't have to spend all the money and all the time for the alignment here with reinforcement learning. What a beautiful thing to do. Because the reasoning skill is inherent, dormant, already in the base model. And then the second paper tells us here, critical part of the reasoning here, we have found one method maybe for a strategic termination so we can save money, energy and time and the calculation. But I think both papers together show us something that what I think the future of AI reasoning is not in building ever larger monolithic models, GPT-5, GPT-6, monster models, but I think understanding here the behavior of open source model, unfortunately, OpenAI never published anything about the black box behavior of GPT-5. So we have to rely on this open source model. And looking into those open source models, we understand that the engineering of sophisticated internal control systems, like the steering vector I talked to you just at the beginning of this video, those are beautiful switches for on and off in the reasoning process. So I can now imagine, hopefully you can also imagine a training process where we start with the base model, acknowledge now, understand that it has already implemented a vast library of pre-trained skills, including the reasoning skills, and we just need here a sparse autoencoder to map out the abilities, find it, create the switch, create here the interpretable skill dictionary for each and every model. And then when we have the switch, we know when to activate here for particular reasoning procedures. And when we train a lightweight scheduler whose job it is to invoke those skills, we can use now the second paper, the counterfactual driven methods like CART, to teach it not just what to do, but when to stop, when to find the optimal equilibrium between cost, time and performance, when to ask for help, and how to manage its own sort process complexity, given its very specific training on a particular knowledge domain. And I think for any of us, and I'm looking at you, my listener here, my subscriber, my member here, I hope that you are one of the ones to build the next generation of intelligent systems. Either it's purely biological or quantum neural system, doesn't matter. Whatever the intelligent system will be, I think this is a frontier where the most exciting work is about to begin. So if you start to be interested in artificial intelligence right now, it's a beautiful time. We have more questions than anything else. We have no idea what is the next step. Everybody is experimenting. And if you have a great idea, if you can develop a framework, if you understand the, the limitation of the current systems, hey, your future will be unlimited. Subscribe and I'll see you in my next video.